If I'm standing before you today, it's because I went to college. And I could go to college because one of the oldest entrepreneurial companies in India created a foundation, the Tata Foundation, that paid for my college tuition. Ever since then, I began noticing that we live in a world created by entrepreneurs, increasingly so. But we don't quite understand how they do it. In fact, the entrepreneurs themselves, if you ask them, don't always provide a coherent story of how they did it. <laughs> Let me give you a few examples. We wake up in the morning, switch on the bedside lamp. We know Edison, the inventor, has something to do with that. But how about Edison, the entrepreneur, and what it took to create G? The inventor was a genius. The entrepreneur, not quite the same thing. <laughs> so as we pour a cup of coffee in the morning, we might think about Starbucks. What a cool idea. But if we go back to the 1980s and look at the original founders and their little shop in Pike Place Market, or even when Howard Schultz came in later and came up with the idea of the coffee shops, we will have to notice that 20 years in a row, coffee consumption had been declining in the United States. As we lace up our running shoes and reach for the MP3 player, we may not know that uh, Nike started as a distribution company, Phil Knight sold shoes out of the trunk of his car, uh, or that Sony was, one of the first products Sony made was rice cookers, because some of their customers at that time would pay them with rice. <laughs> as we run out of the driveway into the street, we might notice the garbage truck pull up. The waste management giant Browning Ferris was started by an accountant. Tom Faggio worked for a top six accounting firm in Houston. And his homeowners association would complain over and over about the garbage problems that they had in the development. And finally, somebody challenged Tom to go out and buy a garbage truck. So he would wake up at four in the morning, go out and haul his neighbor's uh, garbage, come back, shower, wear a suit, go off and do his client's taxes. <laughs> Can you imagine the day he came home and announced to his family, honey, I'm quitting accounting, going full-time into the garbage business. <laughs> all these companies, and thousands like them, that are actually all around us, like the air we breathe, we take them for granted, they all have amazing, intricate patterns and stories in their origins that just cries out for researchers to come along and pull together into some kind of a unifying explanation. We have some explanations. There's a great man thesis that entrepreneurs are somehow very different from the rest of us. Maybe they are risk takers, or if we want to put the negative spin, maybe they are overconfident. Uh, <laughs> maybe they are you know, heroic, they persevere in the face of adversity. And of course, maybe it's in their genes. There's also the luck hypothesis, always a good one to have on your side. And the situation matters too, whether it's the macroeconomic environment in which entrepreneurship happens, or the family background of the entrepreneur. But for those of us who teach entrepreneurship, these explanations are quite, not quite satisfying in the classroom. But wait, we've been here before. In the 16th century, we had very similar explanations for science. Some men can read the signs of nature. There was always providence, and situation mattered particularly because a lot of the scientists then were wealthy gentlemen born into the upper classes. Both in the case of the entrepreneurial method and in the case of the scientific method. These things are true even today. They are valid, they are important explanations. But we are not, we leave entrepreneurship only to those explanations. Whereas with science, we are able to go out and teach millions of people the scientific method, sometimes even fifth graders. As a result of, of that, we have set in motion an explosion in the products of science, in the knowledge that they create in many fields, and in the production of scientists. Derek Price estimates that roughly once in 15 years, the number of scientists in the world doubles. It is very tempting to go back to the early stages 
and ask, what set the ball rolling up that hill? And we find the picture of Francis Bacon, who wrote a book called Novum Organum, where he described his insight that there exists a systematic way for us to understand nature and put its forces to work to achieve our purposes. Now, Bacon hadn't worked out all the details of the scientific method then, but his book kind of inspired a lot of people to fill out the details to such an extent that now we can teach millions of people. And I don't have to go into the amazing benefits that we have found by using the scientific method, whether it's cure for diseases, better communication, faster travel, and so on. Other TED speakers have done a very good job of that if you want to learn more about that. So let's fast forward to the 20th century. The man on the right is Herbert Simon, 1978 Nobel Prize in economics. But Herb Simon was more than an economist. He was a quintessential scientist. He transformed many fields from political science to management, psychology, and computer science. When I was a doctoral student in Carnegie Mellon University, I got to work with him to design a study to look at how expert entrepreneurs think, decide, and act. About 30 expert entrepreneurs, people with enormous amounts of experience building companies, including failures and successes, did an experiment where I gave them a 17-page problem set with typical decisions that happen in a startup, and I had them think aloud continuously as they solved the problem. Since then, about a dozen researchers have begun looking at how entrepreneurs build ventures. Some of them have helped replicate the original study with other groups, but also they've designed their own experimental, non-experimental methods, all different kinds of studies. So we're beginning to map out what we think may be at the core of something that we would like to call the entrepreneurial method. The first thing we noticed in the data was that expert entrepreneurs hate market research. <laughs> <laughs> when we started going in and looking at it in greater detail, we found it's not just that they don't like market research, they actually are suspicious of predictive information of any kind. In fact, if that is the way to make a decision without using predictive information, they would do that. So here's the first insight. Many of us invest in prediction because we believe that to the extent that we can predict the future, we can control it. The expert entrepreneurs kind of flip that belief on its head. When you look at how they act and we look at the histories <laughs> of the companies they create, it looks like they are saying, to the extent we can control the future, we don't need to predict it. Kind of neat, huh? <laughs> Until you ask the next question. How do you control a future you cannot predict? <laughs> so as we begin to tackle this kind of fascinating question, let's remember some of the stories that I started out with. In those stories, I tried to make a case that Expert entrepreneurs don't really start with some brilliant ideas or some extraordinary insight or foresight about the future. They start like you or I might do. They start with who they are, what they know, and whom they know. Even Edison, <laughs> the genius, right? He had the bulb, but going from the bulb to GV is the story that I'm talking about here. So they start with who they are, what they know, and whom they know. And they start doing the things that they can do. Things that they think are doable and worth doing. They don't spend enormous amounts of money or time on it. They only spend what they can afford to lose. And since they don't like market research, they go out and immediately start talking to people, even before there is a product or a prototype or something. And what they're trying to do, as you might expect, is they're trying to get people to commit to their venture, to get people to come on board their venture. Sounds good enough. Let's try to do this with a little toy example. I like this pen here. So let's say that this is our idea. We are going to make a venture of this pen. This is just a toy example, bear with me here. Uh, and this doesn't exist yet, right? This is just a gleam in our eye. It's kind of golden, beige, beautiful, heavy. Um, and we go out and start talking to people we know. Let's say the first person we talk to, or the third, is Jean, an old friend, and she works in retail. And we go ask Jean, you know, here's what we are thinking of doing, Jean. 
What do you think? Do you think you would buy this? Chances are, Jean is not going to jump out of the chair and say, wow, that sounds incredible. I would pay 10 bucks for this, and here's a purchase order for 100,000 pieces. Ain't going to happen. Chances are, she's going to look at this and say, you know, what if it was green? You know, green is in these days. <laughs> or we could go talk to Tom, the technologist here, who happens to be sitting next to us on the airplane. And then Tom says, you know what would be cool? if you could put a heart monitor in it. <laughs> you see, I just lost my mom to a heart attack last year, and I've been looking to develop some product that would have helped her. What do we do now? What would the expert entrepreneur do? Now, one thing we could do is, of course, the standard model, which is persist, right? This is our dream. It is beige, it's golden, it's not green. And we want to do what we want to do. So we might go back and try to sell Jean on why this is such a good pen and why she should actually buy this. Or we could say, well, Jean doesn't get it, so I'm going to go find all these other people. I know in my gut that the world is going to love this thing, they're waiting for this, and that's what I'm going to do. Or we could do the opposite, we could say, Hmm, customer wants green, let's make a green pen. Oh, I didn't have that on there. <laughs> so you could just go off and make the green pen. A third option would be to say, customer wants green, a different color. Maybe there is a market out there for all kinds of different colored pens, you know, yellow and red and blue. Let's go out and map that market, do some competitive analysis, do some segmentation analysis, and then come up with a target segment and then build a business plan. Now let's take the insight that we got from the research and put a framework on all these possible responses. What do we get? Well, if you truly believe that you could, the future is highly predictable and highly controllable, you would persist in your vision. If you didn't believe that, you would adapt. Or you might just be sensible and say, I'm going to try to predict the future the best I can, but I'm not going to assume that I have control over it. However, the entrepreneurs that we study, the expert entrepreneurs, they don't like to predict the future, but they do like control. <laughs> They like to work with things within their control all the time, and they also like control over their outcomes. So what the expert entrepreneur would do is to go back to Jean, go back to Tom, and ask them, what would it be worth it to you to make it green? What, you, what would you be willing to commit to put the heart monitor into it? Notice what they're doing. They're not trying to sell them to come on board. They're actually allowing Tom and allowing Jean to sell us on their vision of our idea. And in the process, the expert entrepreneurs begin figuring out ways to co-create the venture, to co-create the product, to co-create the business model, to co-create the world. By having stakeholders who care about it come on board and self-select into the process. Let's go back to the process diagram for a second. So every time somebody comes on board, we get a bunch of new means, and we set in motion an expanding cycle of resources. Now, Jean might know somebody, a buyer at a department store, and she might be willing to give us their number, or give them a call, or maybe even come with us to make the sales pitch to the buyer at Nordstrom or someplace. Tom might be able to mock us a prototype with a slot for some kind of an RFID chip or something, where we could put a heart monitor, a pedometer, or something. Remember, we're still not making the thing yet, but we are bringing the people on board, and depending on who makes what commitment, we begin reshaping our idea, which means the idea also changes. There are some kind of constraints that get put on it. Now we may be going out and pitching the green pen, or the heart monitor pen, or something else, or both maybe. So over a period of time, if this cycle works itself out long enough, and if enough people come on board, we get not only new ventures, but very often, we end up with new markets that virtually nobody in that process actually anticipated. 
And notice here that each stakeholder is investing only what he or she can afford to lose. And we are not telling them how much to commit, and we are not telling them whether they should be a supplier or they should be a customer or they should be an in investor, but we are allowing them, we are building the corridors so they can come in the, the way they want into the process. Okay, enough for the toy example. Let's look at a real venture. The story of the Grameen Bank. In the early 1970s, Professor Mohammed Yunus was, a, was teaching economics in Chittagong University in Bangladesh. He began noticing that villagers around him were suffering greatly from indebtedness from money lenders, so much so that after a famine or a flood, they couldn't restart their livelihoods. So he did what economics professors might do. He sent out a grad student to count the misery. <laughs> she came back with a number 42. There were about 42 people in the village, and they needed a total of $27 to be able to restart their livelihoods. So Eunice did what you or might, I might have done. He gave them the $27. Surprisingly, a lot of them came back and not only returned the money, but they seemed to be doing better than they were doing before the famine happened. Now that really got Yunus thinking, and he started talking to a whole bunch of people, including bankers, <laughs> saying, why don't we lend this money in a larger scale across villages? And that's when he became an entrepreneur. As he started talking, though, as you can imagine, he got a lot of pushback. The bankers would say things like the poor are unbankable, and that, you know, the loans amounts are so small that the transaction fees, the bank fees to process those loans are larger, so it can be done. Well, but Yunus just worked with whoever would come on board, and he kept doing it enough so that one of the banks was willing to give some extra money to scale up the operation, as he suggested, but with his personal guarantee. But that did allow the cycle to expand a little bit, and as the people who were involved with Yunus, and Yunus himself went out and started building Grameen Bank, they began learning a lot. They learned that it was better to lend to women because the money was more likely to be put to productive uses and it would come back. <laughs> they learned that it was more efficient to lend to a group of four or five people than to an individual. And they started working out the constraints. They started working out tightening up the business model on how lending to the poor would actually work. And as they were doing this, a bigger bank got into the picture, and now they were willing to lend them money without a personal guarantee. And slowly, Yunus also started, you know, like any entrepreneur, you do something, some things work, something don't work, something works, and then you push it, and then you push it. It is that pushing to the next step that makes someone truly a great entrepreneur. So he started pushing it, and he started asking, why don't we make Grameen a real bank? But remember, till now, this is not a bank yet. This is just an organization that's lending money to the poor. So he started pushing for making it a bank. And you know how easy it is to change banking law. <laughs> but it turned out that one of Yunus's old acquaintances, his name is Muhit, was at a conference, and he happened to be the finance secretary of Bangladesh at the time. And they were at this conference, and that day there was a coup, and they were kind of cooped up in this building, in this cafeteria the whole day, and they talked about Grammy and a lot of other things. And a few days later, Mohit was named by the general who took over the country, finance minister. And Mohit started pushing for changing the banking law, and eventually, Grameen became a bank. Many of you might know this story. So this story is not just about how Grameen became a bank. It's also a story about how the microcredit industry got created. Because while this process was going on and they were figuring out what would work, other people began learning from it. They would replicate it. They would modify it in other places. And all kinds of microfinance and microcredit institutions began to come up. Jessica Jackley, who founded Kiva, said in her TED talk how she was inspired by the Grameen model. So there are all kinds of models out there. But the story is not even about that. The most important piece of this story to me is that thousands of Grameen workers go out and knock on doors as part of this process. 
in villages all around Bangladesh. And this is a country where even today, the parda system prevails. And parda doesn't allow women to touch money. But 97% of Grameen borrowers are women. How did that happen? It was not a big law that was passed. It was not the cultural revolution. It was Grameen workers going and knocking on doors, husband by husband, wife by wife, village by village, those of the villagers who wanted to commit to a different world, to a different way of doing things, to achieve some kind of financial self-sustainability, kind of signed on, and they co-created this venture and this industry. A Grameen worker took this photograph of a woman touching money for the very first time in her life and called it very aptly the moment of change. Today, there are over seven million women entrepreneurs in one of the poorest countries in the world. As you can see, at the heart of it, the entrepreneurial method has just a few simple principles and a doable process, just like the scientific method. The scientific method also has a very few principles at the heart of it and a process that people have figured out how to use. But the scientific method allows us to do very profound things, not just technologies and cures for diseases, but it allows us to think through the difference between reality and myth, to choose between A and not A, to choose between better and worse solutions for specific problems that involve nature. The entrepreneurial method also consists of very simple principles and a very simple process, as I have showed you. But it allows, to do, allows us to do something very profound. It allows us to transform the world as it is today, what's and all. We're not waiting for utopia here. You know, what's and all, it allows us to take today and transform it into something new, something a little bit different, but in a way that the stakeholders who commit to it care about. The philosopher Nelson Goodman captured the profundity in a very beautifully when he said this. We have come to think of the actual as one among many possible worlds. We need to repaint that picture. All possible worlds lie within the actual one. Now, when you hear the words actual world, especially since you've just been listening to Mad Mountain, you probably think of a globe spinning on its axis, you know, revolving around the sun, or the pale blue dot that Carl Sagan talked about. But for just a minute here, work with me, and let's imagine that the world is actually shaped like this pen. So this is the world, the pen world, the actual world. Now, what can we do with this world? We can write. But for that, we need paper. So does the possibility of paper exist within this pen world, do you think? Let's see. <laughs> it does. Well, what other possible worlds lie within this actual world, do you think? We don't know. We can't, can't even predict it. But we don't need to. Because all we need to do is to commit to a new world that we care about. I have here my commitment to the pen world. And here's an invitation for all of us to participate in the unlimited possibilities of the pen world. In the pen world, we will teach entrepreneurship not only to potential entrepreneurs, but to everybody. The way we teach science to anybody who has access to a decent education. More than that, in the pen world, we'll teach entrepreneurship not only in classrooms, but by actually committing to co-create the kinds of ventures that we care about, either as entrepreneurs ourselves or as early stakeholders to entrepreneurial ventures. Finally, in the pen world, we will teach entrepreneurship not as a subset of business, but as a way, a method to put business to work, 
to create the kinds of new possible worlds that you and I want to live in. Thank you.